Um, so hello everyone, uh, and you are all very welcome uh, to what is our annual uh, YPN Christmas special uh, for 2023. Um, so we host this event every year to, first of all, celebrate Christmas, uh, but obviously to discuss uh, some very important issues. Um, typically what we do for this event is we actually look back um, to some of the events that have taken place in the previous year, but we're actually going to do something a bit different today, uh, and we're going to look ahead to the political year ahead. So obviously next year will be very significant uh, for both the EU, uh, the UK, and the United States, uh, given some very important landmark elections which will take place, but also in terms of the political developments which will take place in general. So um, we're absolutely delighted uh, to be joined by such a distinguished panel here today uh, who are going to discuss uh, all of these various issues respectively. So firstly, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Katrina Perry, uh, who is the uh, chief presenter at BBC News. Uh, characteristically, she joins us on the, on the telly here beside us, uh, based in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, she's worked as a broadcast news correspondent since 2000, and she was previously the co-anchor of RTE 61 News, uh, which is the most watched news program in, our, in Ireland. She was RTE News's Washington correspondent and bureau chief from November 2013 to January 2018, and she's published two books, uh, the Tribe, the Inside Story on Irish Power and Influence in U.S. Politics and in, in America, uh, Tales from Trump Country, the latter of which was shortlisted for the best uh, Irish nonfiction book of the year in 2017. Uh, and I noted also, Katrina, from your bio uh, that you were shortlisted as Ireland's most stylish woman 2018 uh, in the Peter Mark VIP Style Awards. Uh, but I might give you a run for my run for your money tonight with my Penny's Christmas jumper that I have on me here. So. Um, but Katrina, just over to you. Um, obviously, we'll know you all from our, uh, we'll all know you from our, our TV screens, uh, but obviously you, you've moved to Washington in recent times. Uh, how are things in Washington and uh, what do you think will be some of the big uh, political issues for the year ahead? Thanks, Dara, and thanks for inviting me along. I don't know if it's good a Christmas jumper as you, but I'm wearing a sort of festive green and red dress, if you can see there, especially for the occasion. Uh, no mulled wine and mince pies because it's only lunchtime here, but um Good luck to y'all having a nice evening there. Um, it's going to be a roller coaster of a year in 2024. I, I feel like we say that nearly every year that there's US presidential election because just, you know, so many of us in Ireland and around the world look to see what happens in the US and, and who's running to hold that most powerful seat in the Oval Office. And this year is a really interesting one because... Um, it's almost like there are two incumbent presidents in that we have obviously Joe Biden there and we have Donald Trump looming large and both look at this point to be the nominees for their respective parties. And I will just stress the at this point, because obviously each of them have uh, their own set of issues and circumstances that uh, may or may not mean that they're both there on the ballot paper next November and, and we can get into that in a bit if you want um, but nevertheless on the Republican side of the house um, people are doing what politicians do best and that's giving each other a run for their money to try and have have a go at getting that um, seat in the Oval Office themselves in terms of the issues for the election um, you know they're the kind of the evergreen issues here in the US I suppose of abortion um, of the economy, of immigration. Uh, farm policy is likely to play a greater role in next year's campaign than perhaps it has in the past uh, due to the powerful position that China is in now and, and that kind of balancing that we're seeing between the US and China, between President Biden and President Xi and their relationship that they have to each other. And also, of course, what's the situation in the Middle East at the moment um, with that until now unwavering support that the US has had for Israel. Um, obviously, we've seen a change in tone in the language coming from the administration just in the last really 48 hours or thereabouts. Uh, that's likely to be an issue in the campaign, at least the early part of next year. Um, you know, most Americans statistically every cycle don't really make up their mind until you get to sort of September, October of uh, the run in, the immediate run in a couple of months before the election. And, you know, it's a week is a long time in politics. A day is a long time in politics in this part of the world. And uh, definitely given everything that's going on in the world at the moment, the run that we still have to polling day, really anything could happen. In terms of, of Biden's presidency and how, 
uh, you think the U.S. voter uh, perceives that. Obviously, we've seen some of the polling data. Trump, it seems, is is marginally ahead, at least uh, within the polls at the moment. Though, as you say, anything can change. Um, how would you assess assess you know how successful uh, Biden's presidency has been so far? Obviously, there have been some major legislative wins that he's had on initiatives. Um, but maybe that's not translating into uh, support for him in the polls in the way one might think it would. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Dara. If you look on paper at Biden's presidency, it's been a tremendously successful presidency. He got that Infrastructure Act passed. Anyone who's holidayed or worked in the US will know the state of the roads, the train networks, all of that. Um, and that's something that hasn't been addressed for many, many decades, really. So the massive package that Biden was able to get forward is a major win. Um, also, he's created the most jobs um, for many, many years. 11 million jobs have been created since he took over. Unemployment is at the lowest rate it's been for 54 years. Alongside that, however, inflation is at a 40 year high as well. And wages have not kept pace with that. In fact, the average wage, if you adjust it for inflation, wages are actually down three or four uh, percent since Biden took over the office. So while, um, you know, his other great successes, um, if you were to assess them independently, like the IRA, um, which not so welcome in Europe in terms of what it does for subsidies and all of that, but very welcome in terms of what it does in the US, again, creating jobs in the green tech space. Um, and bringing manufacturing back to certain parts of the country. But ultimately, people look at their own life and what they can afford and whether they perceive themselves to be more or less well off since somebody became president. And a lot of people would consider themselves to be far less well off, uh, notwithstanding that they may have a job now that they didn't have before. Like I said, the wages aren't keeping pace with the cost of living, not dissimilar to the situation in in Ireland and many parts of the world. So, you know, that's why you kind of see the situation where Joe Biden, as I say, on paper, having what would be neutrally described as a successful presidency, he still has a really high unfavorable rating. You know, the unfavorability uh, rating for himself and Donald Trump are in and around the same 52, 54 percent thereabouts. Um, so that's never a good position to be in. It's not an unusual position to be in, but it's not one that um, a sitting president would want to find themselves. Um, and then there has been a lot of debate recently, um, as I say, about the, the situation in the Middle East and the positions that um, Joe Biden has taken up there. So um, his health is a big factor as well in terms of polling and, and what people talk about. Um, so... You know, it, it'll be interesting to see as we get nearer the action, uh, looking at national polls at this point in time or, or really at any point in time has to be taken with a pinch of salt um, because they're just so broad in such a massive country. It's really impossible to capture any kind of accurate sample size. But when you go looking at people in individual states and in some of those handful of states that actually are going to matter come election day, given how this this country sets up how it picks its president they're what really matters and it, and again there's still that unfavorability rating there mm. and you mentioned particularly um you know the us's stance on the on the middle east and obviously since this is a, a group of young people um you know what's your sense on how that has landed with younger voters in the united states particularly given that they would be so critical to president biden's base in the next election yeah, there is a real split um, along the lines there in the demographics and the age profile. Um, the And again, geographic, obviously, people who would be kind of very supportive and, and long term um, supporters of the US's unwavering pro-Israel position are in certain pockets of the country who are going to vote Democrat and vote for Joe Biden anyway. Um, and then it's in other pockets of the country and with that younger base where you see people turning up to protests, just as we've seen in other parts of the world, um, calling for the US to, you know, call for a ceasefire, uh, to not veto the various resolutions that have come through the UN Security Council and the General Assembly. Um, and just for the US to be a little firmer in how it deals with Israel. Um, And again, we've seen that language change, I think, quite interestingly, just in the last two or three days in terms of the messaging that's coming from the president himself and also from 
his national security advisor, his defence secretary, in terms of a stronger appeal to Israel, uh, while also saying it has the right to self-defence, but just appealing it to it to be more cautious of how it's handling civilians and of how it's uh, handling the humanitarian crisis, which is just getting worse by the hour. And you spoke about um, President Trump and all of the, the various legal troubles uh, that he's experiencing at the moment. How do you think those issues will, will play out in 2024? Well, that's a really interesting one. I mean, the president, uh, former President Trump is facing 91 charges, four separate indictments in, in four separate, uh, well, three states and D.C. as well. So that's going to take up a lot of his time next year. It doesn't seem to be really causing him a problem with voters at this point. And that stems from a lot of how um, people in this country and particularly those who would vote for Donald Trump anyway, view elites, view the law, view the justice system, view the unfairness of that, um, who would consider that the justice system or the legal system is set against certain parts of society and the president the former president is doing um sorry i keep calling him the president because in this country they don't use former everyone holds on to their title until uh forever basically but well he um, still thinks he's the president so <laughs> yeah yeah but it's you know they they always refer to president or ambassador or secretary or whatever even if the person hasn't um held that role whereas we would obviously put the word former in there or ear shook or whatever um but anyway, he he's going to spend a lot of next year in court cases in courtrooms defending himself. But actually, in the great tradition of Donald Trump knowing how to use television in particular and use the media, you know, that's kind of free airtime for him. So while all the networks here have vowed not to cover rallies live anymore, as they did in 2016, a lot of them are giving massive wall-to-wall -wall coverage anytime he has a court appearance and obviously the court case in Georgia is going to be televised so you can expect ratings for that to be in the realm of what we saw for the OJ Simpson trial or the Louise Woodward trial in fact if, if people remember that one um, and so every time he's in court it's Donald Trump in the headlines Donald Trump being talked about and you know he'd subscribe to to the old uh, Oscar Wilde adage of, you know, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. So he uses that massively to his advantage. So while he'll be tied up in a lot of this, it's not going to cost him airtime. And in fact, he's using that platform, as I said, to appeal to people that, you know, he, the system is against him and he's going to put, put him back in office and he'll challenge that system for the good of everyone. I, I heard something bizarre today on the radio that he's, uh, I think he's taking the wool from his suit uh, that he wore uh, for his mugshot or something like that, and he's selling it uh, online or something like that to his to his donors and his supporters. I mean, it's it's indicative of, uh, as you say, the airtime he, he gets out of these things, but also the bizarreness of some all of it, really, you know. But um, thank you so much, uh, Katrina. Um, and I'm just conscious Katrina has to uh, leave at about ten past seven, owing to the to the busy news day in, in BBC. But obviously, great to have you here. So I might cycle across to the other uh, two panelists just so we can get some questions in as well. But um, our next panelists, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by uh, Bobby McDonough, um, who is former Irish ambassador to the United Kingdom, the European Union, Italy, and Malaysia. Uh, at the Department of Foreign Affairs, he was EU Director General and later uh, Deputy Secretary General. He worked in the uh, Secretariat of the European Parliament for three years and at the European Commission in the cabinets of two Irish commissioners. Um, he's written and spoken extensively about the EU and British-Irish relations, and he is now a, a public commentator and works as an executive coach. So if you're looking for any coaching, you know where to go. Um, but uh, Bobby, just I suppose the same question for you in terms of the, the UK political landscape. Um, you know, I, I hear in the last few days, for example, there could be some news about a restoring of the executive in Northern Ireland. Uh, I know Michal Martin was speaking about this as well in the last few days, but, but your sense of the big political issues that will feature in 2024 in the UK? Well, I think the biggest issue will be the election. Mm -hmm. An election has to be held by January 2025. But uh, I, don't, I think there's a strong expectation now that the election would take place in October rather than through the December-January period, which is not a good time for an election. And that's assuming that Rishi Sunak can survive that long because he he's, you know, rather daft ideas on sending asylum seekers to Rwanda 
upsets both wings of his party. You know, those who don't want to run any, any risk of breaking international law and those that are really enthusiastic to do it comprehensively. So he managed to get his bill through uh, Parliament uh, this week, uh, reasonably comfortably. But if all those who abstained voted against, and many of them are threatening to, then he would lose a vote in, in Parliament. And he can't afford to go too far towards the extreme right for fear of losing the, the moderates. But I think that that election will not just dominate uh, uh, in terms of the vote taking place, but I think all of the issues will be seen through that prism. Uh, the the Conservative Party, um, or at least uh, Rishi Sunak, he doesn't have a clear, very clear set of priorities. I mean, what is clear is that pretty well everything will be done primarily with a view to electoral positioning rather than to running the country. But in January of this year, uh, he set out five priorities. Then in November, he set out a different five priorities with only a limited overlap between them. And at the party conference in October, he came up with a different set of sort of a scattergun set of priorities, including uh, weakening the Conservatives' uh, approach to the Green Agenda, uh, introducing a new uh, education post-16 arrangement, uh, diminishing smoking over time. It was really scattergun. So I think, uh, you know, it's hard to see which of those issues will will dominate the agenda. I think there'll be a lot of uh, focus on incompetence uh, of, of, of the government. I think it's very likely that the Labour Party will will win the election. I mean, all the polls suggest that. As Katrina says, you know, it's not only until the very end that people's definitive voting intentions uh, become clear, but the poll lead is so large for the Labour Party that it seems very likely that they will win. And Keir Starmer is being very cautious. Somebody said he's like a football team that's 1-0 up with five minutes to play. So he's not he's not trying to score any goals. He's just trying to, to, to ensure that the polls stay the way they are. Um, I think a lot of the issues uh, domestically and the way they're handled by the government reflect divisions within the Conservative Party that had been there for many decades. The divisions appeared for a long time to be about Europe and Brexit. Uh, but now that Brexit has been done, they're a, they're a culture war about other things. So you see it on the migration issue. You see it on climate change, where there's a wing of the party that you know doesn't doesn't believe in addressing it, um, and uh, you see it on uh, migration and 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 almost any issue you can think of. Then on external issues that will be prominent. I mean, clearly Ukraine uh, will be prominent, but on that, the British have a very clear position and a very admirable position, and there's unity between. The Conservatives and Labour on that. Uh, on the Middle East, again, I mean, Keir Starmer is playing it very cautiously, not calling for a ceasefire, but he's managed uh, the, the divisions on that in his party, despite the resignation of eight ministers and the negative votes of, I think, 56 MPs. It was all done in a relatively constructive way. They're not at, at each other's throats the way people are in the Conservative Party. And I think that that problem will largely uh, solve itself for Starmer because of the continued behavior of the Israeli government. He doesn't have to move towards a ceasefire. The ceasefire will move towards him. That's, that's I think, you, you know, Katrina has mentioned the changing language in, in the US, um, you know, with President Biden describing the Israeli approach as indiscriminate. So I think that issue will become more comfortable for Starmer. And then the, the other external issue is, of course, relations with the European Union, which have reached a stable phase. Um, uh, not nearly as bad as they were. Uh, I think the fact that the rhetoric has been toned down is in itself really important because we had all of the Johnson and Truss years with Johnson and his acolytes comparing the European Union to Nazi Germany and to the Soviet Union. You know, absolutely absurd stuff. And, and that has changed. The mood has changed. It's it's more constructive. Uh, the UK have joined Horizon uh, and the Windsor uh, framework has, uh, for the moment, or indeed probably permanently solved the, the, the issue that arose for Northern Ireland from Brexit. Um, but I don't see any further leaps forward in the relationship. I could say something about what Labour might do, but maybe just mm. leave my, my remarks at that for the moment. Yeah, but, but on that particular question about, you know, a Labour government, I suppose, firstly, maybe, um, you know, do you think it is now an unassailable lead for the, for the Labour in the polls? I mean, obviously, we know coming up to elections, things can change? Or do you think Sunak and the Tories have essentially thrown in the towel already and are sort of, you know, managing the losses at this stage? I don't think they've thrown in the towel as in a, 
fight against Labour, but they're fighting each other all the time. I mean, they're, they're deeply divided um, as a party. And no election is entirely predictable in advance. But the polls put Labour so far ahead uh, mm. that, I mean, Starmer himself is not wildly popular. Um, I, I think, you know, his negative rating is around minus 52 or something like that. It, mm. I, um, but it, he has uh, two things going for him. One is that an awful lot of the public don't like the Tories. They don't like Partygate. Uh, they don't like the way that, you know, Boris Johnson clearly lied in Parliament. Uh, and the other thing is that Starmer is a safe pair of hands. He's not somebody that people fall in love with, but people can envisage him as a prime minister. Uh, and so nothing is ever certain, but if somebody offered me good odds, I'd spend a lot of money on, on, on it in the bookies. Mm. I mean, it's, it's. Um, I, I was thinking before this discussion today, obviously you were the ambassador between uh, 2009 and 2013, if I'm, if I'm not That's mistaken. Right, yeah. yeah. And during that was obviously the Queen's visit. Um, and I think at that period, you know, there was a sense that, um, you know, UK Irish relations, we were, you know, after the period of the Good Friday Agreement, we had a peacetime period. Relations were at their pinnacle at that point. And it, it sometimes strikes me just how, you know, how much those relations have deteriorated in that period in 13 years um, since then. Um, where we are today versus where we are then. I mean, do you think there's any prospect if Labour were to get into power uh, that we might see a change in that? Or, you know, have relations been so badly damaged that that might not be possible? Well, you're right about the period when I happened to be there. It was a, an ideal time for me in British-Irish relations because the Good Friday Agreement was under everybody's belt and the madness of Brexit hadn't set in. Uh, you know, Shakespeare in one of his sonnets says, when I consider everything that grows holds in perfection but a little moment. And so when the Queen laid the wreath in the Garden of Remembrance and President McAleese laid the wreath for the tens of thousands of Irish people who died in British uniform, that was a perfect moment. But the problem was that the, the two things that made that moment possible were the European Union and the peace process. Mm -hmm. And Brexit, of course, damaged that in many ways, took the, the British out of the European Union, but also the attitude that they displayed to the European Union when Johnson went for the hardest possible Brexit rather than reflecting the center of gravity of British opinion when he was dismissive of, of, of the European Union. And then, of course, as everybody sensible predicted, including conservatives like Chris Patton and John Major, uh, Brexit upset the Northern Ireland situation. Uh, inevitably, because Europe was the, the air that the Good Friday Agreement breathed and because the European Union made borders less important. So, you know, the, 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 the high point in relations inevitably declined. Um, but I do think they're stabilizing somewhat. I think, you know, Sunak is a normal human being. Um, and the fact he signed up to the Windsor framework shows that he, he, he doesn't, at least in that area, want to break international law and that he values the relationship with the European Union. So it's hard to take it beyond wh where it now is. But I think, uh, I don't see it as an entirely negative story. I, I don't think, first of all, that relations went back to the bad old days. I didn't go that far. And I think where they fell to, they've started to pick up again. Uh, when I saw Michal Martin in London yesterday with David Cameron, I mean, sometimes symbolism matters. You know, I, I don't know the details of what they discussed, but you know, seeing two such, you know, sensible, basically decent people, I mean, Michal Martin self-evidently is, but David Cameron, he made a massive mistake by calling the Brexit referendum and he'll, he'll never be forgiven or forgotten for that. But he's... You know, he's he's sensible on Europe. Um, in the end, despite his crazy referendum, he campaigned passionately, albeit too late for it. And he gets Ireland. Um, uh, you know, he, he handled the Savile report brilliantly. Uh, he wrote his own speech for the House of Commons, which got uh, spontaneous applause outside the Guildhall in Derry. And having seen him occasionally when the Tissue were over visiting, I could see just from his body language that he, he got Europe and he got Ireland. And so I think that's, I'm not, I'm not a spokesman for David Cameron or anything like that, but I think that it, it's a positive element in the way things are picking up. Then about Labour, uh, I mean, Labour have traditionally understood Ireland better than the, the Tories did over the great sweep of history. Um, I think John, John Major, Thatcher certainly began to understand it and maybe against her own instincts, she signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement. And John Major was immensely courageous and his work with Albert Reynolds, in some ways more courageous than Tony Blair because he had to face down exactly the same 
crazy people in his party that that Sunak has to deal with. Um, but but the Labour Party, you know, throughout all that time, you know, Jim Callaghan, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, they, they get they get the thing more. Um, so I think that if Starmer comes in, uh, the relationship will probably improve further. And I think two dimensions of that stand out. One is any improvement with the European Union between the UK and the European Union represents an improvement in UK-Irish relations because Ireland is an integral part of the European Union and the European Union is an integral part of us. Uh, and, you know, Starmer has spoken about, um, uh, for example, reaching a veterinary agreement with the European Union, which would help to resolve the unionist difficulties with the the Windsor framework. And he might uh, deepen and have a slightly more formal approach to cooperation on foreign and security policy issues like the Ukraine, which would be very important. He might rejoin Erasmus. So I think that will represent a, a, a further step. I think there's a limit and maybe a little bit of lack of realism on his part as to how far he can take it, because there has always been a, a you know, a, an equilibrium, a balance between uh, the benefits that the UK can get from Europe and the commitments that it makes to Europe. So you, you can't have access to the single market without accepting free movement to people and all of that. And you know, Starmer may be a little bit unrealistic as to how far he can take all of that. But I think that will, the further progress he will make will be positive. And the other is that on Northern Ireland, the big thing that has been lacking um, since Johnson came in um, has been the fact that the British and Irish governments must work together in Northern Ireland, as they did since the mid 80s. Mm. Uh, and Johnson didn't get it. Well, he didn't get anything. And Sunak doesn't really get it. And I don't think the people around him are, are, are telling him about it. But the reality is that every serious progress that was be made or could be made was the two governments working together. So if you take the legacy bill, where mm. The Sunak government has is is pressing ahead with a bill with which every single party in Northern Ireland is in disagreement, um, for internal Tory political reasons because he wants to appeal to to some of the right wing Tories by saying you know Br British soldiers can't be further prosecuted. But the point is, you you could argue about the ins and outs of the legacy bill. I don't think anybody wants to see people in their late eighties being put in prison, but it is right. I think that that people who have lost loved ones should receive some form of vindication. But the point here is that they should not have proceeded with it in disagreement with the Irish government. So the Irish government is going to decide by January whether it will take um, the British government to the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, as it had to do back in the 70s, uh, you know. And uh, I don't know, I mean, they're getting legal advice on it. But if, if Starmer, um, A, moves to an even better relationship with Europe, and B, understands, as all Johnson's predecessors did, going back to Mrs. Thatcher, that the two governments need to work together, then that will represent another really important step forward. Absolutely, and I'm sure progress in, in Northern Ireland as well in that respect. Um, I do want to take some questions for Katrina, if that's okay, if people have them. Um, so does anyone have any questions about the US? So I see two hands there. Um, I'll go to Connor first. Thank you so much. I'm not ignoring you, by the way. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for the insight. Uh, this could be the year of the third party breakout in the US. What do you think the likelihood of this and who shall we be listening to or talking to or hearing about? Um, I don't think it's going to be the year of a third party breakout. Um, not to rain on your parade there, but uh, I think while there is an appetite most definitely among voters to vote for people other than Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and that's coming across quite clearly in the polling, even from entrenched Democrats and entrenched Republican voters, um, I think the run in from now to polling day is actually too short for any kind of third party um, party as such to get up and running um, individual candidates. Again, the, the system is kind of stacked against them. Like if you even look at um, RFK, as he's being called here, you know, he has to get 1.5 million signatures to get on the ballot. He has to get 15 percent in polls to get to the presidential debate stages. Uh, that's extremely difficult for people to do. What he has going for him is name recognition. And again, that's coming across in polls that, you know, sort of. 13, 14, 15 percent of people have never heard of him, which is a very small number for a third party candidate. Um, but I, I, I just think 
I just don't see it happening now. I could be wrong. And, you know, anyone who claims that this removed to know what's going to happen next November is foolish. But um, I just don't see it happening this year. And I think it's something that would need to burn for quite a while ahead of any polling day to, to really make an impact. Okay, thanks very much. I think it was Deepo as well, was it? Yep. I am Deepo. Um, you just started answering my question with your last answer. There's going to be a lot of voter apathy in this coming US elections, especially with younger and new voters. So my baby sister is a first time voter next year. She just turned 18. And in the last six months, she has supported Trump, then Biden, then Trump, then Biden. And I think now she's on Trump's side. I know that by next month, she'll be on Biden's side. Now, if you were to, like Mr. McDonald said, like get a, a book he gave you like good odds and you wanted to place a bet, who do you think voter apathy is going to affect the most in the next US elections? Not to sit on the fence, but actually I think it's going to affect both candidates in almost, um, almost equal measure. I think it's going to come down to the capacity of voters who, you know, are declared Democrat or Republican voters. It's going to come down to who can kind of bear with it the most and kind of if you want to use the expression hold their nose and do it anyway kind of thing um which was a similar situation that we saw in 2016 with clinton and trump and the republicans were just more able to kind of back their guy even though again we had unpopular candidates there uh, so i i think I, I think voter apathy will be an issue, but I think we'll see like 2020, we'll see record numbers of people actually voting in the heel of the hunt um, because there's going to be, again, a mobilization of voters. Um, and I think people are are feeling engaged in the process in a way that if they don't vote for someone, it's essentially a vote for the other candidate because of how things are stacked up here in the U.S. Um, but I think your sister's story is is quite an interesting one and would be reflected because in many ways, policy wise, there's a lot quite similar between Biden and Trump, particularly on the economic front. You know, Biden economics is all Bidenomics is all about like bringing jobs and manufacturing and all of that back into the middle of America and bringing back the good old days kind of thing, which also is a key part of um, Donald Trump's sort of economic policy. Obviously, on foreign policy, they're very far apart. But um, I think you'll see a lot of flip-flopping like that. I think the polls are, again, probably not going to be terribly accurate. I think you're going to see people telling pollsters one thing or another or saying they're undecided and then doing something different um, when they actually go in to vote, uh, whether that's by postal voting ahead of time or, or on the day itself. Okay, thanks so much. One more over here. <clears throat> so just a quick question. Do you think that Trump has even guaranteed his party's nomination? Because obviously we still have Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley still battling it, battling it out. So yeah, is it a foregone conclusion that he's taking that nomination? Or what do you think? Um, it's not a foregone conclusion, definitely not. Um, and, you know, like I was saying earlier, there's a long way from here to polling day. He's so far ahead of Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, even when you look at the polls that matter very soon, which are those in Iowa and New Hampshire, which might give an indication of actually how people are going to vote. Um, Donald Trump is still so far ahead. I think the Republican Party, you know, as much as there are many of them not comfortable with Donald Trump as a sort of head of their party, they're less comfortable about not having the Oval Office um, you know, and it's it's kind of what people will do to have that seat of power. It's not a foregone conclusion, but it's very likely at this point. Um, but you just never know. I mean, if if Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis end up doing really well in Iowa and New Hampshire, the calendar, the primary calendar is set up a little differently this year. There's a big gap, about two weeks between those two votes and uh, Nevada and then South Carolina is another week or so back from that so that's quite a long time that means anyone with momentum will slow whereas in previous uh, cycles there's only been six or seven days between those first early primary states so that can mean momentum can change money can change um so i think it's not a foregone conclusion i don't think you can say for sure it will be biden v trump next november but i think it's quite likely 
that he will be the nominee at this point in time, but anything can happen. Last call for questions for Katrina. Oh, one more at the back, yep. Hi, Katrina. Um, my name is Katie O'Hearn. Thank you so much for speaking Thanks. with us today. Um, my question is on, do you think that the, the rest of the world, and maybe more specifically the Western world, needs to be quite worried about the political landscape that is going on in the US right now, and maybe even start considering a world where the US is no longer considered to be a major superpower? Because you have one candidate of, of the two that are highly likely, you have one candidate that is probably going to bring everything back to America and ignore the rest of the world to the detriment. And you have another candidate who is seen as the better candidate, but isn't strong and doesn't necessarily have the support of his of the House or the Senate when necessary. And then you also, under his pre presidency, you have his representative in the, in the UN blocking aid to Gaza and using their power of veto. So do you think this is something that the rest of the world needs to start worrying about? Um, I think the U.S. position relating to Israel and Gaza is not unique to Joe Biden. The U.S. has blocked something like 40 resolutions over the years at the Security Council relating to, um, you know, aid or assistance to Gaza. So that's not unique to Joe Biden. Uh, that's a long held U.S. foreign policy position. Um I think there are conversations going on already, uh, not I think, I know there are conversations going on already um, amongst other countries about democracy in the US, which sounds bizarre to even say out loud that, you know, EU member states and other nations would be having those kind of conversations um, at this point ab about uh, the United States. But I think, you know, ultimately every nation acts out of self-interest first, and that's kind of how the international system is set up. I think we're seeing a weakened UN. Um, and I think that's probably something that the international community should be focusing on as well. Um, it's proven itself, you know, very not terribly relevant, let's put it that way, when it comes to the situation in the Middle East and the situation in Ukraine previous to that. Um, but, I mean, voters in a country, it's up to them who they who they vote in, essentially, that's not for, for me to comment on. Maybe just one more uh, before you go, Katrina. Um, you know, I was, um, I lived in Washington, D.C. for a summer. I, I interned in uh, Chuck Schumer's office uh, in the Senate a few years ago. Um, one thing that struck me about the, uh, the media landscape in the U.S. is, I mean, you, you turn on the TV, uh, you know, you have CNN saying one thing, the Democratic talking points, you turn on Fox News, it's the Republican talking points. Um, you know, I, I think your outlet does very good work in terms of providing an, an objective uh, point of view and news source. But, you know, is there such thing really as, as a public square in the US? And I, I think this is particularly important coming up to the next election, uh, where people can get their information independently uh, and uh, factually uh, about political debates coming up to the election. That's a really interesting question, Dara, and I think it applies not just to the US, actually, in a way that issue about the public sphere, public square and where you get information it applies in Ireland and Europe and many places now that people are are switching off from mainstream media providers and, and getting their information elsewhere. Um, you know, thank you for the compliment to the BBC, but that is what we're trying to do here. That's part of the expansion. Why I'm working here now is is to be that sort of bring that public service, public sector ethos to things about being neutral and objective. You have that here already in NPR, radio and PBS, the TV network, but they're very small, they're very badly funded um, and they can't compete in terms of the cash that flows to the networks who have a specific agenda um, and to cater for viewers who want a specific viewpoint put forward to them. Um, so I, I would say that there isn't one particular place that people can go to um, on a wide scale and get all of that neutral information that you're describing there. So it's kind of, it's up to journalists, it's up to civil society, civic society, educators, universities, so on, I suppose, to try and inform people and equip people with the tools to get to the neutral or source information um, when you have to get through so many other individuals and platforms who are curating things for you based on algorithms and based on what you've clicked on before. Yeah. 
and uh, great that we have uh, the likes of yourself over there uh, continuing to do that work. So thank you so much, uh, Katrina, for your time uh, this evening. It's been great to have you and wishing you and yours a very happy Christmas. And same to you. My apologies for having to duck out early and um, have a lovely evening. Thank you so much. And okay. please give applause for Katrina. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks. Excellent. Moving now to uh, my esteemed colleague, who I haven't forgotten, uh, uh, Dylan Marshall. Um, so uh, Dylan Casey Marshall is a, a researcher here at the Institute of International and European Affairs, um, working on EU affairs. He holds an MA in Transnational Governance uh, from the European University Institute in Florence, uh, and an LLB in International and European Law from the Hague University of Applied Sciences. Uh, prior to joining the IAA, uh, Dylan was a correspondent and editor with the pan-European media project EuropeLex, which many of you may know, uh, which aggregates, analyzes, and contextualizes election and polling data across Europe for a pan-continental and international audience. He also worked at the Feltrinelli Foundation, Shannon Aaron, and the European Federation of Public Service Unions. So Dylan is going to speak to us uh, this evening about uh, the European Union. Uh, and all of the various changes that we will have there with a, a new European Commission, obviously with the European elections taking place in June, uh, and potentially a new president of the European Council as well. So, uh, Dylan, over to you. Um, what do you think the main uh, issues will be in 2024 in the European Union, uh, in EU politics, and how do you see those various changes playing out? Yeah, so there's some in EU policy making it's kind of a bit different than the US, the UK, that there aren't hot button specific topics that come up uh, due to the nature of policy making in the EU. There's overarching issues that continue for many, many years. These include obviously climate change, the war in Ukraine, the Middle East crisis, migration. And so those will persist in the next year, particularly going into the European elections. Uh, so right now, the European Parliament for the basic entire history of the European Parliament has been uh, governed by a coalition of the Socialists, the Liberals and the EPP. So a grand coalition between the three parties. Uh, but this potentially could change after the next European elections, uh, given current numbers from uh, just last month, November 2023. It seems like the right wing of the House, which includes the EPP, uh, the European Conservative and Reformist Group and Identity Democracy, which would be on the far right. They collectively have about 120 more seats projected than the left of the House. And it doesn't seem now, given the current numbers, that the grand coalition that has uh, governed the European Union over the past years will be able to keep that centre hold to secure a majority. And additionally, in the Council, which is extremely important for proposing the President of the European Commission, uh, there is currently, depending how you uh, identify far right, either three or four uh, members of the far right sitting in the European Council at the moment. And so for proposing the President of the European Commission officially and legally, you just need a qualified majority. but. Politically, there is at least consensus, if not unanimity in these respects. So at the moment, it looks like the Spitzenkandidaten process, which took place for the last two European elections, is not going to be followed after the fiasco of 2019. Uh, this is where each of the European political parties proposed a lead candidate to then become president of the European Commission. And so far, the Green Party, the European Green Party, has initiated the process to identify a lead candidate. But the two major parties, the EPP and the Party of European Socialists, who this time in 2018, before the 2019 elections, had already identified their lead candidate, they have not said one single word about this lead candidate process. So it seems like this is gone. And so ahead of the elections, it looks like the European Union and the European institutions themselves are very focused on trying to get turnout up because historically turnout has been very low for European elections. And so that's a real priority they're pushing for towards and also trying to deliver on key issues of climate change, you know, look, have a good look coming out of COP and show that the EU is, as it likes to brand itself a world leader and really show that this is the case. 
And then there are certain issues that will just come up in every election, like cost of living, living standards that a lot of people, particularly in countries like Germany, feel like their living standards are decreasing quite a lot and their economy is stagnating, which will have knock-on effects for the wider European economy. And then issues in Southern Europe and Europe as a whole, like that never go away, such as migration will persist. Mm. And I suppose just on, on some of those issues, um, and obviously, uh, you know, in terms of the, the Spitzenkandidaten process, is, is the implication of that that we may see Ursula von der Leyen re-elected as commission president? How likely would you see that being? And I suppose, how would you assess the performance of her uh, commission in its current mandate at the moment? Mm -hmm. Well, according to the treaties that govern the, the operation of the EU, the European Commission president and the composition of the European Commission has to reflect the results of the European parliamentary elections. What that actually means is another thing. Uh, but given current polling, EPP are well ahead of the second biggest grouping, the socialists. And I would say Ursula von der Leyen has had some scandals and controversies but very few of these have really trickled down to national media and have caused headlines in national media and she is generally seen as a amongst important policy makers generally competent uncontroversial unbalanced decent european commission president and given that i can see quite a high likelihood that she gets re-elected or at least re-proposed for the European Parliament to vote on because it goes from the European Council proposed to the European Parliament who then vote on whether they accept the president. Mm -hmm. And so I would say in all likelihoods, there's a good possibility that she could continue, um, but it could be similar to 2019 when a candidate comes out of nowhere, like no one expected Ursula von der Leyen to be president of the European Commission this time in 2018. Um, and then on her time, I would say in 2019, she set out six priorities on all of them. I would say she did mediocre, <laughs> some better than others, but I don't think she really did amazingly at any of them. That could, that's down to a lot of issues like unforeseen things happening, COVID. You didn't expect that to happen in 2019 when she was saying her priorities also a full-scale war in, on the continent of Europe and the implications that has for energy, the economy, all these things. So I'd say she's done decent, but not amazing. And then a lot of the things that she could have done better and her policies have, in my opinion, have been very reactive and not proactive, such as the industrial policy. She was reactive to the US. She was reactive to unilateral decisions by EU member states that the governments took. And given the state of the world, she could have seen, and the lagging state of the European economy, she could have seen maybe a European-wide industrial policy is needed rather than waiting for the US, seeing the fallout and the response of European business. Maybe just one more before I, I, I throw it open to the, the... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Abby, yeah. Because I, I was ambassador to the EU as well. Yes, of course. Um, th thank you very much uh, to learn for that. Um, I, I would be um, a little bit more uh, optimistic about things. I mean, I, I don't see the extreme right um, becoming, while well, they are on the rise in some places, becoming in any sense a dominant force. I'm not, not, nor indeed were you, were you saying that. Uh, I mean, you have, Poland has switched from the far right or relatively far right to, to the center left. Spain has a, a center left government, the UK, Although it's not in the European Union, but it's moved to a more constructive position on Europe, and you know, it's just my my instinct is so European, and I hope it doesn't cloud my judgment. But I think Europe has performed very well in many areas. You know, providing some leadership at COP on on climate change, uh, introducing the first um, uh, AI legislation, uh, reacting very well on COVID after a shaky start, reacting very well on on Ukraine. Uh, in many ways. And I, I, I think that von der Leyen um, has been a good president. She's probably the best president since Delors. Uh, and she played a big personal part in getting in drawing together the EU's response on Ukraine. But I do think she made one major error, which is on the Middle East, um, where she, she went to um, Israel in the immediate aftermath of the Hamas attack and 
allowed the misperception to, to be there that somehow she was representing the views of the member states, which she wasn't, and also making a misjudgment. I mean, it, it was self-evident that some sort of restraint should be urged on Israel and what they were likely to do. And, um, you know, having said, I think she's performed very well generally. I think she got that one wrong. And I think it may affect her chances of re-election. We were talking about the division between young and old people. And, and she hasn't really corrected that either. She hasn't even moved after Biden has moved to making strong criticisms of Israel. And many of us like me think Biden should go further. But she seems to be um, bound into a German mindset on that. And, and the other thing I'd say is that, especially with the prospect of Trump coming in, the European Union is more important than ever. I mean, it does have weaknesses, and Dylan, you're right, it doesn't do everything by any means perfectly. But where else in the world is going to provide leadership on basic decency and democracy and the rule of law if the United States has the second Trump presidency? It's not going to come from there. It's not going to come from Putin. It's not going to come from China. So with, with all of the errors that Europe makes, because it's an, human imperfection is part of human nature, and no country or organization uh, or, or human being should be judged on the basis of perfection. It's the, it's the populists who claim that perfect world is possible and you don't need to compromise. Uh, I think Europe is, with all its, its weaknesses, warts and all, is set to become even more important into the future. And, and just on, on Dylan's point about the, the priorities, um, how would you assess the, the performance on climate change? I mean, on the one hand, there's been some very ambitious uh, targets in terms of the European Green Deal, but I suppose the implementation of that and how, how close we are to those at the moment. Well, the implementation largely falls to member states, hmm. you know, and I, I, I think Europe has played a big part both internally in Europe and in, in COP because um, having had a process over many years of developing um, internal EU policies where targets are set, it's, it's that that puts pressure on Ireland to do the things that it's doing. It doesn't mean that Ireland or other countries live up to what's been agreed, but there are legally binding targets. Uh, and I think it's a very good example of, of the, the soft power of the European Union. And I think, you know, if Europe had on its own drawn up the outcome of COP, it would have drawn up a different outcome. But it was the first to veto the first draft of the conclusions, which didn't make any reference in any form of words to phasing out fossil fuels. Uh, and I think it plays a, a broadly benign role on that. Questions? Um, we have about seven minutes left. So well, I'll take them a quick part. So uh, I have two here. Any more? Um, three. Okay. We'll take those three together then. Thank you. Hi. Um, this is a question for Bobby. Um, so you said that I think as the political climate is shifting in America, obviously, you know, there's a good possibility that Trump is going to go into another four years of presidency. So I guess my question is, why does doesn't the EU, the EU maybe kind of shift their attention towards forming new alliances? Like, for example, you know, you see a lot of really great development in Central America and Mexico. And, you know, as BRICS is forming and kind of overtaking South America, it seems that there should be a little bit more emphasis perhaps on, you know, creating new alliances. So I'm just curious as to why the EU isn't like really focusing on that at the moment. I think the EU uh, works on its relations with every part of the world. It's very largely with trade focus, given the competence of the, of the European Union. But in terms of sort of politics and security, there has been no alternative to the United States and NATO. I know Ireland's not in NATO, but, um, you know, in terms of the balances of power in the world, Europe and the United States working together has been important for, you know, for a century. And uh, Europe has to hope that uh, we won't see a reversion to Trump because it would be it would be disaster, not just for the United States. I mean, Fiona Hill was here speaking at the U.S. Embassy there a few weeks ago. She said, you know, God knows what will happen. Um, she said she'd fear her for herself. Uh, you know, Bi uh, Trump would try and imprison, in, in, you know, go after the whole Biden family, all of that. Um, but he will go after the U.N. He'll go after international cooperation. He will withdraw from NATO. Uh, and then... On top of that, uh, he will give a boost to um, to populism around the world, to the, the crazy people like in Argentina or the you know Boris Johnson who fed off the the Trump phenomenon. So I, I think if that happens, Europe has already moved. I mean, they've they've become far more involved in Ukraine, giving a lot of assistance. I think it's is it 20, 20 billion pounds in military assistance, fifty billion in economic assistance. Uh, but they'll have to 
it all bets are off if Trump comes back and Europe will have to go much, much further to look after its own interests and to go deeper, as you say, into, but you can't like making better relations with Latin America, which it does work on. It's not going to change the equation in terms of the power between China and Russia and America and the, and Europe. Um, but it, it's doing it all the time. It's giving, I, I think it's true to say that the European Union and its member states give far more than half of the development aid that's given in the world. You know, so they do work on 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 developing their alliances elsewhere. I also didn't fully agree with Katrina's criticism of the UN because you have you have to look at decision making procedures. You know? And the the UN uh, ha- gives vetoes to China, Russia, the United States, uh, and Britain and France. And you know, it's not it's not like um, the Irish government sitting down and deciding, you know, how it's going to handle the agriculture portfolio. The decision making procedures in the UN preclude um, the UN acting effectively on the on the Middle East as long as the, the US blocks it. And they preclude acting effectively on Ukraine if the Russians block it. You know, so it I think, you know, and then the decision-making procedures are locked in. Uh, and the same is true in the European Union. I, I, I don't think you can blame an organization for um, not taking decisions because the decision-making procedures preclude those decisions being taken. Of course, Europe should have a much stronger position on the Middle East. But no country wants its sovereignty in the foreign policy area to be overridden. So, um, yeah, it's, as I said, it's imperfect, but uh, the, Europe's greatest strengths are also its weaknesses. The strength of unanimity, everybody has brought along, the strength of the rule of law. The rule of law, Europe is 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 set to be the world leader on the rule of law, especially if, if Trump comes back in. But that's what prevents Europe from acting against Orban and Hungary. Because it can't just sit down and say, let's expel Hungary or let's suspend Hungary because it has to apply the law. Uh, two more, and I'll take them quick fire, please. Um, just in the interest Sorry of about my so... non-quick fire reply. Oh, no, 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 you're grabbed, don't worry. <laughs> I mean more so in terms of the question. <laughs> uh, Mr. McDonough, on UK elections, <clears throat> in, at the last local elections, the Conservatives lost over a thousand seats. I, I saw that coming, but I, that's unprecedented some numbers so do you think those local elections will have it that will do you think the next general elections will be a direct reflection of that but on a different scale so do you think it's going to see the same type of losses but not as much as a thousand because there's, there's not as much seats on display then you talked you touched the rwanda asylum plan but you didn't but like this is what i think what rishi sunak has done in the last six months with immigration is to appeal more to the far right UK citizens that don't think that anybody represents their interests. In the last six months, the UK has banned people from bringing dependents, made stricter rules for people to come into the UK, aside the Rwanda asylum. So do you think that plan to tighten his hold on far right UK citizens is working? And I'll take the other one then as well, please, if my hand is still up. Oh yeah. Thank you. Um, going back to the climate aspect of the EU and it has been, hugely successful in COP28. However, there is a slew of regulations coming through the European Union at the moment. Necessary, yes, but do you think it's coming at the risk of completely hampering business within Europe and it'll be overtaken by the US and other countries? Of course, those are very big questions. Yep. Um, so maybe maybe the first one to yourself, Bobby, yeah. and then I'll give okay. the second one to Dylan, if that's okay. Right. Um, so the question of the of the local elections and the, and the, and the, and the national elections, uh, I mean, I, I suppose, uh, I think Sunak is going to wait till October for the general election, but he could he could do it earlier so as not to have a huge defeat in the local elections. But I think that's unlikely. I think he will, he will, do, he will do very badly. I think the outcome of the general election, the precise outcome will be very important because the Tories almost certainly will lose a lot of seats. So I'll put my money on that. If they lose seats um, mostly in the red wall seats, which were sort of pro-Brexit and not traditional conservative. If if they lose most of the seats there, then there's a good chance that Sunak will be strong or that his successor will be a, a relative moderate of the centre. If, on the other hand, they lose more in the other part of the UK, then the chances of somebody like Suella Baravman uh, coming in will be there. Uh, and likewise, it's important for Labour how big a majority they have, because if they have a big, a big enough majority that looks as though it will last for for two um, parliaments, then he can think strategically 
Um, so the size of his victory is going to be very important. On 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 the Rwanda thing, um, I, I I do think he's pandering to the right. I think it's a it's a problem that the Conservative Party has had for decades, and the touchstone was Europe, but it was really about something deeper than that. Uh, and you know, I don't think the majority of pe British people um, believe in it, but they're believe in the Rwanda policy. I mean, after all, look, last year more than seven hundred thousand migrants went to the UK and they went there because Britain needs them in the same way that our country is enriched by having having migrants but they're fixated on these people coming across on small boats it's it's not as big a problem as asylum seekers in Germany or France it's just manufactured into this into this huge issue uh, it, if I could take one minute of your time I just I I'd just like to read out something that I, I brought here as I was coming along because I was thinking about you know what is the basic divide in British society? What, 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 and it's mostly within the Conservative Party. It's the right of the Conservative with, with Farage. And I just came, I came across this thing that it was the last report I wrote in, in, in London uh, in 2013 when I was ambassador. And I tried then, and I think accurately, to capture what, what the divide in the UK is really about. Um, I was wrong about one thing because I didn't predict Brexit, but one sometimes, this is the last thing I'll say, one sometimes has the impression these days that there are two Britons. On the one hand, there is the open, tolerant, modern Britain, the Britain which exercises significant influence in the wider world through its engagement in international organisations, through its culture and language, through the reprioritization of its foreign policy. The Britain which took the London Olympics in its relaxed stride and celebrated the diversity represented by its athletes. The Britain which welcomed, without the batting of an eyelid, the 150,000 German football fans who recently came to London for the all German Champions League final, the Britain where so many Irish find a warm and welcoming home, the Britain several of whose schools take the trouble of laying wreaths which I have seen at the German war cemetery near Ypres with cards bearing messages such as in memory of brave men who died for their country. On the other hand, there is also a more uncertain, backward looking, narrowly nationalistic Britain, the Britain which has lost confidence in its ability to defend its interests in the multilateral globalized world of the 21st century. The Britain which increasingly allows UKIP to set the political agenda on immigration and Europe. The Britain which would rather undermine an international court which it played a central role in establishing than implement a straightforward ECHR judgment on prisoners' voting rights. The Britain which sees its values as uniquely attractive and at the same time uniquely under threat. The tabloid Britain that hankers after a world of lost empire and lost certainties. The Britain that replaced Ireland several years ago in thanking God that it's surrounded by water. I think that stands the test of time. I think that's th that divide is right at the heart of the Conservative Party and it hasn't gone away. Very, very nice note to end it on from yourself, Bobby. But Dylan, uh, just very quickly on the Clive question, I would, of course, put it to you, Bobby, as well, but we are out of time. So. Yeah. Yep. So just very quickly on climate versus business uh, uh, dichotomy that over the past five years, the Commission has taken a sort of deregulatory, uh, at least rhet rhetorically, approach to uh, decision making and the legislative process in the EU with the one in one out uh, rule, which I don't necessarily think it has one followed or two is actually desirable uh, to be looking for better regulation rather than just less regulation. Uh, and then secondly, like specifically on the case of climate, uh, recently they've introduced the Net Zero Industry Act, which is currently going through uh, the Council and the Parliament. And this is the EU's direct response to the US IRA. And it gives uh, kind of streamlined regulatory processes for new tech and green industries and businesses and things like this. And it's really trying to promote small, medium-sized businesses, particularly in also deprived, under underdeveloped areas, and also cross-border projects to kind of promote, obviously, European integration that the, the, the Commission would wish to see. And secondly, there's also the Carter border adjustment mechanism, which you're introducing, which will see, similar to the, what the US is trying to do, keeping production within Europe. Because if a good is imported into Europe, then the there'll have to be an import levy on equivalent to the level of carbon that is produced if it comes in from China, say. Uh, so that is also trying to keep business in Europe and prosperous, et cetera. And then just like, Kind of more generally, there is uh, the TCTF, which was brought in in response to Ukraine and COVID, which allows wide array of state aid mechanisms for national governments to promote 
uh, business and strategic industries, and it's you know said to be time limited and uh, targeted. Whether that's the case, one could argue. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of things that are brought in to try to keep business here. Whether it is successful is ways to be seen, and some big CEOs uh, have said it doesn't go far enough compared to what the US is doing, and then specifically what China's doing as well. Uh, but I think we have to wait and see that, you know, there's famously the phrase saying there's no jobs on a dead planet, there's no in economy on a dead planet. So action needs to be taken and maybe it's better that we're doing it now rather than later when it will have to be much more Spartan, much more aggressive and that will hurt the economy more down the road. So that's just my two cents. I think we, we've seen a sense of that from the COP as well. Um, but just want to say a big thank you to uh, to our panelists, uh, both of our other panelists, Bobby McDonough uh, and to Dylan Casey Marshall. Um, a big thank you to all of you uh, for coming along tonight. There will be a few more drinks outside, so please do stick around. Um, and we'll be back in the uh, new year uh, on the 9th of January, where we will have Dr. Patricia Scanlon, who is Ireland's AI ambassador, and we're going to have a discussion on the future of AI and what that means for Ireland and the world. So I hope we will see you then. Uh, until then, a very happy Christmas and a happy new year and see you then. Thank you so much.